Okay, so let us start this lecture with uh, this topic that I had briefly mentioned towards the end of the earlier lecture and that is uh, quantum mechanics using Lagrangians which is uh, another way of uh, speaking of path integrals. So, normally you know in your undergraduate quantum mechanics you would have been taught uh, quantum mechanics basically the subject uh, using Hamiltonians. So, it means you would have been told that uh, in order to study quantum mechanics you start with a Hamiltonian and you look at the generalized coordinates and generalized momenta and you now think of them as operators and you introduce commutation rules between the coordinates and momenta and then your Hamiltonian becomes an operator and so on. So, that is the usual way in which uh, quantum mechanics is taught, but then that gives you a kind of biased uh, view of uh, quantum mechanics as if uh, somehow you cannot do uh, quantum mechanics with Lagrangians because after all you know in classical mechanics it is the Lagrangian formalism that is taught first and the Hamiltonian formalism is usually less familiar to most students because we usually learn in the especially in when solving problems we use Lagrangians uh, quite extensively in classical mechanics. The Hamiltonian approach is used uh, less frequently, but in quantum mechanics it seems like it is the reverse. Uh, but uh, that is not really an accurate uh, statement or meaning even if that is uh, uh, the case, but it should not give you the impression that somehow Lagrangians cannot be used to study quantum mechanics. So, the whole purpose of this present today's lecture is to convince you that you can do quantum mechanics with Lagrangians just as well as you can do quantum mechanics with Hamiltonians. Of course, there is a catch in the sense that uh, there is a catch obviously because otherwise it would have been included in all your syllabus by now. So, the reason it why it is uh, not frequently encountered in your syllabus that is discussing uh, quantum mechanics from a Lagrangian perspective the reason why that is not included in many syllabi at least at the MSc level is because to do that you need to understand or you should already know how to do functional integrals. So, that is exactly why I introduced that topic in the last few lectures and explained to you how to do functional integrals. It is only after you have uh, developed some familiarity with that uh, rather novel uh, concept called integrating over function spaces, then only you are equipped to understand how to do quantum mechanics using Lagrangians. So, that is the reason why people do not discuss it that frequently, but now that we know how to do functional integrals we should not hesitate to understand how to do quantum mechanics using Lagrangians. So, let us proceed that way and uh, so if you remember towards the end of the last lecture I was pointing out uh, uh, these uh, facts that so in other words see if you want to uh, it is not clear entirely how we should proceed because you see there is this Hamiltonian approach which involves eigenstates and uh, matrix elements right and expectation values and so on. So, the implication is that you should be able to somehow reinterpret those concepts in a systematic way such that you reach a stage where you are now discussing the same concepts now using functional integrals uh, rather than these uh, more traditional concepts. So, the idea is to start with familiar concepts like matrix elements and so on and systematically uh, rework those familiar ideas until you reach a stage where now you are reinterpreting that in terms of not only in terms of Lagrangians, but also in terms of uh, integrals over function spaces. So, let us see how to do that. So, you see uh, in general uh, the um, in quantum mechanics uh, in the traditional way of doing quantum mechanics there is the Hamiltonian approach to quantum mechanics. Uh, you are typically called upon to evaluate uh, something like a matrix element like this. So, for example, you could be asked to do a matrix element of this sort. So, for, for example, suppose Q is the operator and you want to find the matrix elements of, of this operator 
between two states some initial state and final state. So, the initial state could be for example, the, uh, the initial state of some quantum mechanical system which evolves according to some Hamiltonian. So, and uh, so the initial state after a while becomes the final state which is F and now maybe you are called upon to find the matrix element of some operator which could depend on R and P. Remember what that is, that is just P vector, uh, that is P operator. So, there is some observable perhaps Q R comma P and you want to find the matrix element uh, with from the uh, uh, with respect to the initial and final state. So, the final state determined by the time evolved uh, initial state. So, in other words uh, the idea is that you have uh, so to determine the final state uh, from the initial state you will have to necessarily solve an equation of this type and you know what that is, well, you know what 7.2 is that is basically the time dependent Schrodinger equation. So, that if, if somebody tells you that this is the initial state, so this is a first order equation in time, so you solve that and you get the final state. So, uh, so the point is that formally you can always write this, in other words the final state can always be written in a very sim especially if the Hamiltonian is time independent. So, if you assume that say the Hamiltonian is described by a kinetic energy like P squared by 2 m and a potential energy, I am talking about one particle, okay. So, there is one quantum particle uh, subjected to some force which depends on its position. So, it is a very simple uh, example, it just meant to illustrate how to get to the idea of path integrals from your traditional ideas of uh, matrix elements, Hamiltonians and so on. So, for that purpose I am focusing on a problem that is incredibly simple which is just one quantum particle subject to some force uh, which is derivable from a potential energy called V of R. So, and that too that force is time independent, so your potential energy is time independent. So, if it is time independent then the final state is a very simple unitary time evolution of the initial state, okay. So, that is all very familiar to us from our prerequisites that is uh, your elementary quantum mechanics. You see now what we do is now that you know what the final state is because it is the time evolved version of the initial state, you insert that here and that is going to be your actual matrix element of that observable Q that you are interested in. But now keep in mind that uh, if uh, any operator, okay, so anything like uh, any, any operator like this uh, can always be written as uh, uh, e raised to a by n whole raised to n, uh, that is a trivial identity because there is nothing, I mean nobody will question this. So, that is what I have written here. Okay. But the key is the following that because I have put an n downstairs and I, I and uh, this capital N is anything I want it to be for any capital N this is an identity. So, specifically I will make uh, I will now pretend that N is really really large. So, if N is very large I can make this approximation. So, I can see normally I cannot write uh, E raised to P squared by 2 m uh, plus V of R as uh, E raised to P squared by 2 m into E raised to V of R, I cannot do that regardless of whatever else is there. See the reason is that because these two do not commute, kinetic energy and potential energy do not commute, right. So, because of that I cannot do this. So, if uh, in classical mechanics I can do that, but in quantum mechanics I cannot do that. So, they do not commute. But however, if I because there is an n next to it, so because the coefficient next to this are very very small, I can do this because the whatever corrections, whatever mistakes I have encountered, I, I have uh, incurred by doing this, it will be actually small by a factor of epsilon. So, that mistake tends to 0 as 1 by n tends to 0. So, that means if capital N is uh, very large, uh, I can still do this. So, this becomes exact as capital N tends to infinity. So, that is the reason why I introduce that capital N in the denominator. So, it is only then you can and you can justify this. So, this is called Trotter product formula, this is an exact mathematical result 
which says that e raised to a plus b where a and b are operators that do not necessarily commute with each other. So, if you have e raised to a plus b you cannot simply blindly write it as e raised to a into e raised to b because a and b do not commute. But uh, if they do not commute you can still write it as uh, something which only has a and something you know, only has b but only in this way. So, in other words you have to write it as e raised to a divided by n into e raised to b divided by n then you have to whole raise it to n then only it is correct and n tends to infinity. So, you might be wondering why am I doing all this and uh, I mean obviously I am doing this because I know that uh, pro by following this procedure I will get to what I am interested in and you should never lose track of what you are interested in and what we are interested in is basically going from a Hamiltonian description of quantum mechanics to a Lagrangian description of quantum mechanics. So, that is that is what we are interested in and the claim is that if you follow this procedure you will get there sooner or later. Okay, so, let me go ahead and proceed that way. So, now what I am going to do is that I am going to imagine that there are certain, so regardless of what uh, I am going to introduce some new states which I call R of k. So, R of k is basically some uh, some state, some eigenstate of position of that particle uh, where the eigenvalue of the position comes out as R vector subscript k. Uh, so, if, if you act the position operator on this, this is going to be R of k acting on R of k. So, that means this is the uh, eigenvalue. So, uh, so I am going to introduce this. So, uh, you just have to bear with me because a whole bunch of new concepts that I am throwing at you and it is not uh, clear what the motivation is that I am just saying consider this, let us imagine that this is there and so on. But you will soon see why I am doing all this. So, if suppose I introduce an eigenstate of position of this sort, then the matrix element of this object between two eigenstates like R of k and R of k plus 1. Okay, so, the implication now is that that k is some kind of a discrete index. So, uh, the matrix element between these two uh, is what I want to evaluate. But to evaluate this I am going to use my simple uh, trotter type of decomposition. So, I am going to write an operator which involves these two non-commuting operators in the exponent which is the kinetic energy p squared by 2 m and the potential energy which is V of r. Okay. So, these two are non-commuting, but then uh, so they appear as a sum in the exponent, but the claim is that I can still write them as uh, products, means that I do not have to retain them as sum in the exponent, I can write, write them as a product of uh, two operators, one is only involving kinetic energy, the other on, involves only the potential energy. So, that is because uh, capital N is sufficiently large and any mistakes I make are of the order of 1 by N smaller than the what is correct. Okay. And uh, the mistakes tends to 0 as N tends to infinity. So, this is now, so, so evaluating this is same as evaluating this. So, that means evaluating the matrix elements of this unitary operator which describes time evolution is same as uh, doing this. So, the reason why doing this one is simpler than the starting uh, original question is because now you see uh, now that I have written it as a product of two things, I can insert a complete set. So, I can in insert a uh, identity written in this funny way. So, you all know that, uh, so I can think of P of k now as an eigenstates of the momentum operator whose uh, eigenvalue is now p of k. Okay, so, this is what that is. So, now if this is the eigenstate of the momentum then it obeys a completeness condition. So, this is called the completeness condition. So, you should know all these things. I mean quantum mechanics is a prerequisite for this course. So, I am going to assume you know what I am talking about. So, if that is the case then uh, because this is a uh, identity, I can simply insert an identity here. I, I can insert identities wherever I want, but specifically I am going to insert it in between this operator which involves only the kinetic energy and this operator that only involves the potential energy. 
So, if I insert it here, so now answering the original question which is what is the matrix element of the time evolution operator between Rk and Rk plus 1, uh, answering that question is the same as first finding the matrix element of the sort which is between a position eigenstate and a momentum eigenstate of an operator that only involves the kinetic energy times uh, a similar matrix element involving only the potential energy. So, uh, so the bottom line is that this is easy to do because you see uh, because PK is an eigenstate of momentum this, this particular whatever I am circling now has a very simple answer and that very simple answer is it is just replace this operator P squared by P of K uh, squared because you see P is now an operator which acts on the eigenstate of momentum it just simply becomes its eigenvalue and it goes outside and then you just get this one. So, R of k p k times uh, this one okay and uh, epsilon is basically this T f minus T i by n okay. So, epsilon is that T f minus T i by n. So, uh, so that is what you get. So, this simply becomes uh, this matrix element, the first matrix element of, of this uh, evolution in involving only the kinetic energy between R k and P k is simply uh, the matrix element of R k and P k times something which involves the eigenvalue P k. Okay. So, similarly the matrix element of the uh, time evolution involving only the potential energy between P k and R k plus 1 is also simple because now you see V of R involves the position operator R, but now it is acting on an eigenstate of position whose eigenvalue is R k plus 1. So, what does that mean? That means we can simply replace the position operator R even though it is inside V of R you can simply replace it by its eigenvalue which is R k plus 1. So, instead of uh, having operator V of R, we will have this number V of R k plus 1 because R k plus 1 is the eigenvalue of R operator. So, now it just becomes a number which is uh, uh, V of R k plus 1 and then you get back your uh, matrix element which is remaining which is P k and R k plus 1. But now you all know from your quantum mechanics that uh, the matrix elements of R and P is just this exponential e raised to i r dot p by h bar. If you have forgotten how to conclude that it is it comes from this that uh, suppose you want to calculate this, this is same as because P acts on P k and produces P k as the eigenvalue, but alternatively in the position representation it is just this and uh, the dependence of R k is only this. So, it does I mean in the position representation I mean the operator acts on R k not on P k. So, you get this. So, since these two have to be equal this is equal only if this is true. Okay, so, I am going to assume you know all that that is just quantum mechanics it is not part of this course it is prerequisite. So, bottom line is uh, the matrix element that I was originally interested in finding which is the entire evolution operator between R k and R k plus 1 is now therefore given by this integral over that complete basis which is integral over all the p k's times whatever it is that we have uh, found along the way which is uh, which is this times this times the, the rest of it okay which is this. But now so uh, you see uh, now things are beginning to look up because uh, we have looked at I mean it looks doable now and in fact it is doable because you see uh, certainly the integral over p k is what we have to do and that is very doable because it is just a shifted Gaussian there is a Gaussian e raised to something times p square and there is something involving only the linear term and that is very easy to do and it is just a shifted Gaussian and you simply do it and when you do it you get this answer. Okay. So, the answer to that original question what is the matrix element between R k and R k plus 1 of the entire evolutionary operator the answer is this. 
okay. So now you see, now I am going to do the following. So I am going to assume that uh, this k in this sequence that I have introduced is actually the discrete uh, version of some continuous parameter, right. So I am going to assume that uh, r depends continuously on s and I have divided this s into various pieces and r k means uh, the piece where that r depends upon the that particular value of s at the index k. So in other words, r k is basically, so you will have to imagine that r is now following some path parameterized by s and now that path has been broken up into pieces which is why it is called r k. So r k is the kth uh, location of that path, okay. So I, I mean I am entitled to make that reinterpretation because I, it was I who introduced that concept of R k and I can choose to give it whatever meaning I desire. So I decided to, I decide that that is the meaning that I, I am entitled to do, uh, interpret it any way I want, okay, because I was the one who introduced that. So, uh, so the point is that R k plus 1 the, uh, minus R k by epsilon therefore now has this interpretation of uh, the slope of the path along, uh, basically it is the slope of the path as parameterized by S. So it has that meaning, okay. So that is the meaning of uh, this ratio. So if you interpret that way and that is how we are going to interpret it, this is going to be like this and why is that because you see now this is going to look like, see what is this, it is e raised to i by h bar times epsilon into 1 half m into r dot squared because you see this, is, so what is going to be here is r k plus 1 minus r k divided by epsilon whole squared and what is r k plus 1 minus r k divided by epsilon, it is r dot. So basically what you will get is r dot squared. So that is what this one, this will become. So this, this whole term will become e raised to i by h bar into epsilon into half m r dot squared. And what is half m r dot squared? It is basically the kinetic energy. And now what is this? This is, uh, this is nothing but minus v of r. So now you see there are no operators, keep in mind that now we are dealing with matrix elements. So uh, after calculating matrix elements, there are no operators left, uh, we have explicitly evaluated them. So these are all numbers now, no operators are here, rk is an eigenvalue, rk plus 1 is also an eigenvalue, v of rk plus 1 is the value of v at the eigenvalue rk plus 1. So they are all numbers basically. So therefore, I can uh, happily put this in, in I mean, uh, now, now there is no issue like e raised to a plus b not being equal to e raised to a into e raised to b, that issue does not arise because these are actually numbers now, not operators. So in that case, you simply uh, combine it this way and now you know what that is. Once you combine it's half mb squared into r dot squared minus b of r and what is that? is obviously the Lagrangian because half m r dot squared is half m v squared which is kinetic energy and uh, b of r is potential energy. So that is basically the Lagrangian which is what I have written here. So it is e raised to i, i by h bar into epsilon into the Lagrangian, okay. So that is uh, as far as the answer to this question is concerned. But that was not my very starting original question, this is some intermediate step. So I asked what is the answer to this? So the, what is the answer to the matrix elements between Rk and Rk plus 1 of this uh, evolution operator raised to 1 by n? And the answer is this. So it is nice to know, isn't it? Because this is, this involves a Hamiltonian because it is p squared by 2m plus v of r, which is basically Hamiltonian. And the matrix elements of that between R, Rk and Rk plus 1, there is the position vectors uh, eigenvalues. 
that matrix in involves the Lagrangian now. So, the left hand side involves Hamiltonian, right hand side involves Lagrangian. So, now you see uh, where we are getting at. So, in other words, I told you oh, the whole purpose of today's lecture and that is to do quantum mechanics using Lagrangians. So, the original question involves matrix elements involving Hamiltonians which is the left hand side of this. But then with a suitable uh, interpretation and you know by a series sequence of steps, I now have, am gradually converting that question to something involving only Lagrangians. Okay. So, the Hamiltonians have gone away and in the place of that I am getting Lagrangians. Okay, but still that is not the whole story, that is just an intermediate step and what is that an intermediate step of? So, the and the, it is the intermediate step in the following sense that it is basically, so this is what I originally wanted, right? I, I wanted to know what is this. So, so instead of calculating this, I have written this in this way and then I am calculating the matrix element of uh, only one of them, not the whole race to n. So, now I have to answer the original question, what is the matrix element of Q? That was the original question. So, this is some interesting intermediate step. So, let us go back to 7.4. Okay, so, so, this is, so, this is what whose, in fact, we want the matrix elements. So, typically, we can always think of this as, for example, suppose I was uh, some initial position, so eigenstate of uh, some position vector. It could be anything. So, for simplicity, we think of I as uh, the initial state as the eigenstate of position with eigenvalue R0. So, imagine suppose the initial state had a well defined position, that means the particle had a well defined position, and uh, so the initial state was prepared in such a way that the particle is exactly at R0. So, now the question is uh, how would you um, therefore? So, if that is the case, then uh, you would typically uh, answer such questions. Okay. So, I mean right now, I'll, let me just keep it in general. So, imagine that R0 is my in, uh, initial state. So, in this path, so, okay, so uh, uh, this path, so remember that Rk is one of the pieces of the path. So, I have interpreted it like that. So, now I want to suppose I want to calculate the matrix element between R0 and Rn because I have decided to break it up into all these pieces. So, if this is the uh, question I want to answer, so I will tell you later why this is a valid question to answer. Right now it is not clear, but suppose this is the question I want to answer, that is I want to calculate this matrix element. Okay, If that is the question I want to answer, then Answering this is same as writing like this first because then I put in a n and raise it to nth power. This is anyway obviously an identity. But now you see what is this? This is something, some operator raised to n. So that is uh, in other words, it is the same operator multiplied n times. It is the some operator, you know, n copies of the same operator one next to the other. But uh, so, instead of writing that as just uh, n copies of the same operator u, 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 u like that, I will simply insert an identity. So, I will resolve the identity and write like this. So, I will put identities here. So, I will put uh, identities of this kind. I can put identities of any kind, but specifically in the first uh, first gap between uh, two of these u's, u means uh, this one, u means whatever is here, this is my u. So, this is u raised to n. So, it is a matrix element of u raised to n between R0 and Rn. Instead of inserting uh, anything, I, I can insert any way of resolving the identity, but specifically in the first gap between two u's, I will insert, I res will resolve the identity in this way. Uh, involving eigenstate R1 and its adjoint and similarly in the second gap I will put R2 and so on and so forth. So, I will resolve using R2 etc. etc. So, that is the whole idea. So, I have resolved it this way. 
okay. So then, uh, so that is easy because now you see uh, it will then uh, have this flavor. It will then have, it is the same as doing this. So writing this now after having resolved it like that, it is the same as now doing this because it is now going to be a successive product of matrix element between Rk and Rk plus 1 which is what that is, okay. So now uh, this matrix element we have painstakingly evaluated and uh, we have realized that basically even though it involves a Hamiltonian to start with its answer involves now a Lagrangian, okay. So that is what that is. So it will the final answer to that matrix element even though the original question involved a Hamiltonian, its matrix element uh, the final answer involves the Lagrangian. So the final answer between these two R0 and Rn is actually an integral over all those intermediate positions of the particle all the way starting from R0 all the way up to Rn. So now I am going to reinterpret this, uh, this type of a product. Uh, this product uh, of an exponential is really exponential of the summation clearly. So now you see the epsilon into sigma has the quality of an integral because that is what the definition of integral is. It is just uh, divide up into small pieces and each piece has size epsilon and you add up all of them you get an integral. That is what integral means. So I am just adding up all the small small epsilons. So when I, if I add up small small epsilons I am effectively doing an integral. So that is what that is. So rather than write it as a discrete sum because now n tends to infinity and there are infinitely many pieces but then the distance is R0 and Rn or the end points. See remember that n has to tend to infinity because otherwise that, uh, that kind of uh, separation is not valid. This is wrong if n is not tending to infinity. So I have used this explicitly in my, in all the steps. So I have no business to make this statement unless n is very large. So it, so when n is very large you see uh, that uh, all the summations become integrals and that path becomes smooth and continuous rather than discrete. So then you are integrating now over a path. Okay, so and uh, you are integrating over all intermediate points in the path, so that is why it is called the path integral. Okay, so you are integrating over paths. So this is my R0, this is my Rn and you are integrating over all paths that connect R0 and Rn. So that is what, the, so now you see why I said you need functional integration because R is a function of some parameter S and you are integrating over all possible such functions. So that is what that path integral is. You are integrating over function spaces because R is a function of a real variable called S and you are not integrate, you are integrating over S but on top of that you are integrating over all such possible functions which depend on S. That is you are integrating over all possible R bracket S, all paths connecting R0 and R, Rn. So that is the whole idea. So therefore, if you want to calculate the matrix element of an evolution operator like p squared by 2m plus v of r that means uh, an evolution operator corresponding to that Hamiltonian and the matrix element is between some initial position r0 and final position rn, the answer is basically a path integral of the integral of the act e raised to i times the action, i by h bar times the action, so this is called the action. Okay, so the in time in, uh, S is now you can think of it as time if you want but you do not have to but basically it is some parameterization. So, so it is some uh, parameterization such that when S is the initial value it is R0 is, uh, is the value of R for the path and uh, it is Rn when it is the final value. So that is certainly the action in some sense. So um, in any case S has the dimensions of time because uh, yeah, that is how we have defined it, right, uh, because it is basically um, 
delta s is T f minus T i by n. So, basically the matrix elements of uh, this time evolution operator which involves only the Hamiltonian is now a path integral over all possible paths connecting R 0 and R n. So, now coming lastly to the my very original question, what was the original question? So, the claim was that in quantum mechanics the most general question that you can answer that is of practical utility is find the matrix element between some initial and final state of some observable, some general observable Q with a function of position and momentum. So, now we are equipped to recast the answer to this question in terms of a path integral and why am I saying that? So, the reason is because now you can insert your, uh, so here I am going to insert a complete uh, set. So, this, so that I am going to insert an R 0 here because now this is going to involve integral over R 0 and now I am going to insert a R n here. So, I am going to insert an R n there. Okay. So, when I do that, so I can always do this because th these are complete sets. So, it is like inserting identities there. So, now one, once I do that, I will now get this one and this is what we have painstakingly just now evaluated, we have just evaluated that. So, therefore, uh, the answer to this question that is what is the matrix element of some general observable Q from some initial state, some general initial state to some general final state is basically given by integral over R 0 R n of, of the matrix element with respect of this Q from I to R 0 times this path integral over all paths connecting R 0 and R n times this overlap and then finally you do this integral. So, so once you, so you see, so the answer to this question involves first doing this path integral and then doing the rest. I mean the rest is not related to path integrals, but the important thing is that somewhere in between you have to do a path integral and that path integral involves a Lagrangian rather than a Hamiltonian. So, that is the thing. So, so here is also the original question if you want to answer using your undergraduate level of quantum mechanics, you would write f as uh, e raised to minus i t f minus t i times h which is Hamiltonian, right. You would write it as uh, initial state times evolution. Evolution involves Hamiltonian and then you would evaluate this in the usual way. But now I have rewritten this in terms of the Lagrangian uh, rather than Hamiltonian, but the price I have to pay is that instead of uh, using familiar concepts like overlaps and operators and all that, now I have to work with a path integral over all the functional integral over all paths connecting two points and only then I can then evaluate this matrix element. So, in general the prescription is the following that if you want to find the expectation value or basically anything, you just have to multiply that by this e raise to i by h bar into action and integrate over all paths keeping that next to that. Suppose you want to find the expectation value, it is it's a very simple interpretation. You think of this as your weight. So, expectation value of any quantity which depends on the path for example. So, you multiply that quantity which depends on that path by this weight which is e raised to i by h bar into action. You integrate over all paths then divide by the normalization. Normalization is e raised to i h bar divided times integrated over all paths. Okay, I think uh, this is a good time to stop and in the next class I will be discussing the applications of the path integral approach. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm.